Merlin, being travel wise, knew the perils of the road. He passed many a goat herder as they fared upon the grassy verges. The landscape, though dry, still managed a tidy meal for their charges, although dependent they were not. For he knew that man flourished upon their milk and cheese in those inaccessible regions of the mountains, and that if it were not for man, they would charge down the mountain and consume to their heart's content, forsaking the dry bush that only it can bear the shallow soils. Man alone, though, could not control a herd, so they use their best friends, the dogs. Now, the dogs need to eat as well, and they feed off the scraps from the butchered beasts that thrive on the lower pastures where the rivers run wider and the grasses grow greener. On this night the moon rose late and a wolf prowled the higher regions, feeding off the goats that strayed from the pack. Of course, the well-fed dogs would defend them as much as they would defend their masters, and so any sign of a wolf would set the alarm bells ringing and the noisy sound of barking would awake their masters too. The wolf stirred the goats to bray, as they had keen senses too, as did the dogs who started to run from the house to the pack. Merlin happened to be in the vicinity in a makeshift hovel and could hear the cackle from the distance. The wolf set up a howl as goats scattered and dogs pounced. It ripped into the pack, looking to get one kill at least. But six dogs, dwarfed in size to the wolf, as they were, quickly circled it. The wolf, of course, decided to bite at the dog instead. Those plump, fat bodies will serve just as well, <laughs> fed as they were on beef, food that the wolf could get nowhere near. Whelps and growls drowned out any shouts the distant goat herders were emitting. Whilst the wolf did its best as one dog, after another, tore at its legs. The goats by now had scattered, and the wolf, hopelessly outnumbered, took off towards the woods, where the dogs lay chased up into the trees, were too thick to penetrate. The wolf, licking its wounds, came by Merlin's makeshift hovel, and peered in. Their eyes met, but despite the hunger of the wolf, he could not dare approach any further. They spoke, Merlin, just a shadow. You have come to seek refuge. Is this what you are lacking? I need answers. What is the law here? Why is my domain, once king in these parts, been removed from me? To be king is to have responsibility. When you thought you were king, you were only a hunter. But it is my prerogative to kill and eat. Your goats get fat on scrub and grass. Your dogs get fat on trap and biscuit. Your men get fat on beef and wheat. What is left for me? I feel your anguish. Little are you favoured by humans. Can you not see? Your progeny gave birth to the dogs, who learnt to cooperate with man. It is your own doing. And with this, the wolf slinked off muttering some unpronounceable words in the distance. A few days later, a story had got out that the wolf had attacked a hunting party of men on horseback and had been slain. Merlin by this time had moved on and the very same hunting party was crossing his path. First though came an unmounted horse bearing the royal seal on its leather work. The horse stopped at Merlin's makeshift hovel and peered in, obviously snorting and breathing heavily after the gallop. It bore wounds on its body. You are bleeding, 
Have you come here to seek refuge? Oh, Lee, I need dancers. Why should I be driven against a wolf to protect my rider? Must I not save myself first? Yes, I see you bear the king's emblem. And such a fine horse as you would have as your master the king himself. Does the king survive? That is not my concern. When my ancestors were king, we roamed these fields freely. Now not a single one of us abounds. From the day we are born, we are harnessed into slavery with bit and bridle to turn this way and that. Even the dogs have more freedom. Ah, but you get fat on the hay and straw they feed you. And you especially get your coat brush. And your hooves shooed. Have you not been selected for a special position? Yet you complain. If I had the choice, I would always choose freedom, than mindless battle fare. Then go and see how long you will last without a mate. And with this, the horse snorted and browsed on the thickets of the woodland. Two days later, the shouts of horsemen came hither with the royal party mounted in full regalia. They were forty strong, and the king was obviously mounted astride another beast, loaned by one of his consorts, but nevertheless powerful and of high pedigree. Merlin now lay in an area more open to the edge of the woods. He had made a fire, and his makeshift hovel was substantially large. The smoke attracted the attention of the party, and a scout was sent forward. He peered into Merlin's den, and said, By orders of the king of these lands, devoted landlord and protector of the people, I hereby order you to come forth from your shack, and bear no weapon. But Merlin wouldn't move. Instead he said, Greetings, lackey. When I hear it from the king himself, then I will judge. I cannot judge your word. At this, the lucky felt insulted. How, how dare you contravene the king's word? Ah, but I have heard the voice of two kings before this. Why should I take your word to be the true king? I will hear it from the king himself. This is preposterous. And he went away snorting. On hearing this, the king quizzed over this character. Two kings before I? You must go back to him, man, and show him the royal seal. So the lackey did. Only for Merlin to say. But I had seen the mark of the royal seal twice before. Once on a wolf, another on a horse. What makes yours any different? The lackey looked away in disbelief. How can you compare the king to that of an animal? Obviously welling up with anger inside. But I am not. I am merely comparing it to you. This is sophistry. How dare you? How dare you? Tie me up in words. Words, no. But language, yes. Your king needs to present himself personally. You will be done for treason. And he grumbled as he left. The king on hearing this quizzed over this character again. He pondered an hour and decided to approach the camp alone. His aides were <laughs> aghast. But the king ordered them to stand their ground. He approached the fire pit, some 100 metres from his hunting party, who now scattered in all directions of the circumference. The king had given an order that at each wave of his hand the party should approach by half the distance. On arriving, the king briskly asserted, I hear you have met two kings before, dubious as, is, as it might sound. Ah, but it is not for me. Will you come out and face me so that I may see you? It is for you 
to face yourself. Face myself? What could you ever possibly mean? And he gave a wave so that the party approached 50 metres closer. For, if you claim to be the king, you must show responsibility to man and beast and plant alike. And, do not the farmers work their animals? Do not the beasts of the wild have their freedom? Do not the forest from which you bend your home grow of their own accord? Is this by your hand or the hand of someone greater? It is my responsibility to my people. Yes, but the beasts in the forests, for which you order to cut down to build your palaces and your fortifications, are groaning by your hand. Your responsibility surely is to balance all in the call of harmony. It is my God-given right to make decisions for the welfare of my people. Don't put on my conscience yourself righteous admonitions when little can you face the outside world why will you not show yourself and he waved again with the party approaching 25 meters more but i am here in full glory and you do not enter to be the king surely means to face your fears look into the fire what do you see the fire of course we are like logs, each of us. When we burn, we give light and heat to our neighbours, so that we may burn together. Do you think your log is any brighter than the other? Merlin did not wait for an answer. If your log burns down, surely your place will not be missed. At this, the king fumed. How Dare you condescend to me? And the king waved again, the party drawing to twelve metres. So these are your protectors. Who is protecting who? And with this the king shouted, Seize that man! And all the men rushed into the makeshift bender, which on being so full sprang open to reveal nature still growing. The king, however, remained outside, and one of the men said in a whimpering voice, But there is nobody here. At this, the king entered, surrounded by his hunting party. The king said, Have no one speak of this in court. I must not be shown to be lacking. But once a year the king would come to this spot, and he would light a fire. On his deathbed he asked to be buried there, and a great mortuary chamber was built to house his bones, with a fire lit once a year. Merlin, however, was nowhere to be seen. But when the wind blew, some say they heard his whispers in the trees. In the trees in the trees.